My presentation will focus on what four individuals were doing in 1940 and then explore how their lives intersected after the war. Uh, we'll also have a uh, surprise guest appearance from a, a new arrival at Chautauqua. Uh, permit me then to introduce this morning's dramatis uh, personae, two Europeans and two Americans. They are, in no particular order, Hermann Goering, 47, uh, at least 47 years of age in 1940, already long infamous by then the Reichs Marshal of the Greater German Reich, commander of Germany's formidable Air Force, and Hitler's designated successor if, as the Fuhrer put it in a 1939 speech, anything should befall me. Unfortunately, nothing befell me. Alexander Slalakis, age 33, you just heard about him on that NBC piece, a senior Lithuanian police official working in Vilnius, which today is the capital of Lithuania. Francis B. Biddle, age 54 in 1940, serving then in the United States Department of Justice, my agency, as this nation's Solicitor General, having just been appointed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And, of course, Robert H. Jackson, age 48, the newly appointed Attorney General of the United States, having been named by FDR to head the Justice Department in the same month that Biddle was appointed to the Justice Department, to his Justice Department post, January 1940. Let's look briefly at what each of these four men was doing in 1940. 1940 was a year of continued conquest and growing power for Hermann Goering and Nazi Germany. In 1940, Goering was secure in his status as the second most powerful uh, person in, in Germany after Adolf Hitler. He had already been at the Fuhrer's side for nearly 20 years, having joined the Nazi party in 1922 and been appointed by Hitler almost immediately thereafter as head of the SA, or the Sturmabteilung, Hitler's much-feared brown-shirted stormtroopers. He had been with Hitler during the so-called Beer Ball Putsch in Munich in November 1923, marching beside Hitler at the head of the SA forces, and although he was still addicted in 1940 to morphine as a result of a serious gunshot wound that he'd sustained when the Bavarian police broke up that 1923 march, Goering was, in 1940, known internationally as one of the Third Reich's leading figures. An intimate of the Fuhrers, he was frequently seen and photographed at Hitler's side. By 1940, Goering's homes included a vast manor house north of Berlin and also a mountain lodge in Berchtesgarten in the Bavarian Alps, not far from Hitler's own retreat. Goering's mountain lodge was so charming and boasted such magnificent views that Life magazine had dispatched a photographer to take pictures of it for, the weekly, for that weekly publication five years earlier in 1935. Germany's launching of World War II the previous year, 1939, had provided Goering with an opportunity to continue expanding his domain. He was already in charge of Germany's economy, had supervised the creation of the Gestapo, he commanded the Luftwaffe, and he headed Germany's four-year rearmament effort. With Goering helping to direct the course of Germany's war effort, the Third Reich's expansionist drive intensified dramatically in 1940, and Goering participated in the planning of every invasion. Between April and October of 1940, just seven months, the Third Reich occupied Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, the Channel Islands, and Romania. On June 14, 1940, the German army entered Paris, France. The German juggernaut was literally rolling over all opposition. On September 27, 1940, the Axis Alliance was formalized when Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Tripartite Pact. For the Jews, 1940 was the beginning of the end. On May 20 of that year, SS authorities established the Auschwitz concentration camp outside, the later death camp, outside the Polish city of Oswiecim. On June 30, German authorities ordered the first major Jewish ghetto, Łódź, Poland, sealed off. And on November 15, the same treatment was inflicted on the 350,000 Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. The escalating war made for dramatic newspaper headlines on this side of the Atlantic, 
particularly once the Battle of Britain began in the summer of 1940. Let's look at some of those headlines. They really tell the story. We'll just go through them quickly. Here's the New York Times. Nazi tanks now within uh, 35 miles of uh, Paris, I think it said. Uh, French counterattack is uh, not going to go very well. Uh, Norway's army gives up. Now Italy's at war, ready to attack. It's a stab in the back, says Roosevelt. The government has fled Paris. France yields its fleet under the armistice, gives up the west coast, half of the country. Britain and France are in an open break. Now the Battle of Britain. British forces and the Nazis battle for mastery of the sky. Hitler warns Britain to quit. Lay down your arms or face total war, he says, in what he presents as his last offer. German radio urges British people to lay down arms. Fortunately, thank God, British rout the Nazis in a plane battle. And now the two countries are attacking each other's cities. Sirens shriek in London and Berlin as the air war terrorizes millions. Uh, Goering's conquests also put ever larger numbers of Jews within the country's reach, and Goering played a major role in directing the genocide. In this 1941 document, later used at Nuremberg, Goering ordered Reinhard Heydrich, head of the Reich Main Security Office, to arrange, quote, for a final solution of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe. We all know the tragic results that ensued, from the Nazi death camps like Auschwitz, seen here, to the killing ravines and pits like this one, uh, I'm sorry, uh, like the one at Bobby, uh, Bobby Yar, Ukraine, and this one uh, at uh, Panerai, outside the uh, uh, wooded hamlet of, um, well, not right was the word of Hamlet, but not far from Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, where some 50,000 Jewish men, women, and children were methodically shot. This is a surreptitiously taken photograph, and these are uh, Jews being assembled uh, for execution. The war also gave Goering the opportunity to seize vast numbers of valuable paintings and other artworks. Here we see Goering and Hitler looking over a painting, not a looted one, uh, as it, ha as it happens in this particular case, alluded pa a, a painting that the Fuhrer had just presented to Goering as one of his many rewards. Our second historical figure is Alexander Svelaitis. He was a military and police official in pre-war independent Lithuania. 1940 was a year of catastrophe for Lithuania. In June of that year, pursuant to a secret protocol to the German-Soviet non-aggression treaty, signed the preceding summer. The Soviet Union invaded Lithuania and annexed it. Lulenkis, a devoted anti-communist, fled to Germany. He probably thought he would never see his homeland again, and so he applied later in 1940 in Germany for German citizenship. Here's some documentation from his German citizenship application file in Berlin, and as we'll see later, that those materials turn out to be very, very important in what we do later at the Justice Department. Lulekas' plans in Germany were interrupted the following June when Germany turned on its Soviet ally and invaded the USSR. Soviet-occupied Lithuania was quickly captured by Nazi Germany. With the communist regime expelled, Lulekas rushed back to Lithuania, where he was promptly installed by the Nazi occupation authorities as the head of the Lithuanian Security Police, the Saurumas in Lithuania, the head of the Lithuanian Security Police for all of Vilnius province. The Saurumas was the Lithuanian analog to the Gestapo, and it soon became a major participant in the mass murder of Lithuania's Jews. Although the truth would not come out for many decades, as we'll see, Lulekas himself was a senior level participant in the genocide. Next up, is Robert H. Jackson, seen here elegantly attired in a, a pair of 1940 photographs. Here's the other one. Here he is with his wife. Uh, born in his father's Pennsylvania farmhouse and raised not far from here in uh, uh, Frewsburg, New York, Jackson had attended Frewsburg High and later Jamestown High School, after which he apprenticed in a law office in Jamestown, where today the great Robert H. Jackson Center stands 
devoted to preserving and building on his extraordinary legacy. He never went to college, but he did complete a year of law school at Albany Law School, and then he apprenticed again, eventually becoming a member of the New York State Bar and a very successful, he used to put it, country lawyer in this area. Jackson's talents were known to Roosevelt from his days as a politician here in the Empire State, where Roosevelt, of course, had ultimately served as governor. As president, he appointed Jackson to a series of important federal positions in the 1930s, general counsel of what is today the Internal Revenue Service in the Department of the Treasury, assistant attorney general in charge of the Justice Department's tax division, then assistant attorney general in charge of the Justice Department's antitrust division, and then solicitor general of the United States, a position in which he served until January 1940. Then, as now, the Solicitor General is the second highest position in my agency. The Solicitor General, currently Supreme Court nominee Elena Kagan, is the Justice Department official who represents the government before the United States Supreme Court and who determines which cases decided against the government in the lower courts will be appealed. 1940 was a banner year for Robert Jackson from the very start. In January of that year, FDR elevated him to the exalted position of Attorney General. Here he is uh, at his desk as Attorney General in 1940. Here he is again. That's, that's an old uh, dictating machine. Uh, there are a few of us here, uh, not us, but a few people here who, who remember those. Um, as Attorney General, uh, Jackson was a top advisor to the President, of course, and FDR regularly summoned him for late night and also early morning bedroom breakfast meetings. With fears of espionage and sabotage on the rise, FDR placed Jackson in charge of securing our borders and combating spies and saboteurs. Jackson supported a bill to legalize federal wiretapping on suspicion of a felony in progress, um, but the bill failed. A top priority for FDR was providing, sorry, a top priority for uh, FDR was providing material support for embattled Britain, but he needed a legal way to do that. The Neutrality Act seemed to pose an insurmountable obstacle. FDR turned to Jackson, and Jackson found a brilliant way to provide assistance without running afoul of the Neutrality Act. Jackson hoped that with U.S. support, Britain could defeat Germany without the necessity of combat involvement by U.S. forces, a prospect that he dreaded. Of course, that was not to be. Robert Jackson served as Attorney General of the United States for a little more than a year. In early 1941, Roosevelt appointed him to the United States Supreme Court, where he began a new distinguished phrase, phase in an already distinguished career. Last, but certainly not least, among our leading men this morning is Francis Biddle. Born in Paris, he was a man of privilege, aristocratic bearing, and impeccable old line heritage. A member of one of Philadelphia's most storied families, he was related to James Madison, and was a great-great-grandson of Edmund Randolph, who'd been a leading figure in the Revolutionary War, an extremely important participant in the Continental Congress, later Governor of Virginia, U.S. Secretary of State, and, as it happens, the very first Attorney General of the United States. A graduate of the Groton School, Rose, Harvard College, and Harvard Law School, Francis Bill had been appointed to a succession of important federal positions by FDR in the 1930s. And in 1939, he was appointed by Roosevelt to a judgeship on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in his hometown of Philadelphia. Uh, but Biddle served on the court for less than a year. 1940, our year here, saw Biddle return to Washington. President Roosevelt appointed him in January to serve as Solicitor General of the United States to fill that position when Robert Jackson vacated it on his promotion in that month to the position of Attorney General. So the career trajectories of Francis Biddle and Robert Jackson, two rising stars in the Democratic Party, bring them together at last in 1940. And for all of that year of 1940 and into the next, Biddle now worked for Jackson, and their relationship, from what I understand, was a good one. Here they are, uh, together at the Justice Department in 1940, Biddle in the center as uh, Solicitor General uh, of the United States, and Jackson uh, on the right as Attorney General. The following July, when Jackson was tapped by FDR to fill the U.S. Supreme Court vacancy, Jackson was again succeeded by Biddle, um, and uh, Biddle became Attorney General. Here he is 
as Attorney General. In that position, Biddle was, of course, on the inside as the Roosevelt administration grappled uh, with a War Department proposal to round up Japanese citizens and Japanese Americans who were in the United States. Biddle strenuously opposed the idea of taking American citizens into custody. Sadly, he lost that, that battle, though he fought a heroic one, and the inter internment program was, was carry it, carried out. Here's another a photo of Attorney General Biddle. Uh, his executive assistant, Hugo Perusi, is seated next to him at the left side of the uh, photo. Let's, let's remember the name Hugo Perusi for later. Robert Jackson's departure for the Supreme Court ended the working relationship that Jackson and Biddle had enjoyed, but their paths would famously cross again one day, as we will soon explore. Following U.S. entry into the war after the uh, Japanese attack on U.S. naval forces at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7, 1941, Germany declared war on the United States. Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States fought a long and bloody war against the Third Reich. <coughs> Finally, on May 7, 1945, Nazi Germany surrendered to the Allies. The war in Europe ended the next day. Franklin Roosevelt hadn't lived to see this day. He died on April 12, 1945, less than a month earlier, and he'd been succeeded by his vice president, Harry S. Truman. The nation's joy at seeing the war in Europe end was tempered by the knowledge that American families had lost fully 200,000 of their precious sons, and many daughters as well, in the battle to bring an end to the Nazi nightmare. This is the uh, U.S. Military Cemetery above Normandy Beach and also by the knowledge that Americans were still fighting and still dying in the war with Imperial Japan. The Nazi concentration camps were at last liberated by Allied troops. This is Nordhausen. Uh, and those troops were horrified by what they found there. In a joint declaration issued at Moscow back on October 30, 1943, the Allies had demanded that Hitler and his minions desist from their, quote, atrocities, massacres, and cold-blooded executions, close quote, warning that war criminals would be brought to justice after the war. And on January 22, 1945, more than three months before VE Day, Attorney General Francis Biddle and the Secretaries of State and War had sent a memo to FDR recommending an international tribunal to try the highest-ranking German leaders and the organizations through which they'd acted. The discovery at war's end of the gas chambers, ovens, and death pits, strengthened the resolve of the Allied powers to bring the perpetrators to the bar of justice. And public pressure to do so grew as well. Although Churchill, not, as many believe, Stalin, first proposed that the Allies simply shoot the surviving Nazi leaders, the Allies decided instead to hold trials to show the world, and especially the German people, what terrible crimes had been committed and to demonstrate the superiority of the rule of law over the rule of might. Truman asked Justice Robert Jackson to take leave from the Supreme Court and serve as chief U.S. prosecutor at the trial of the male of, uh, main offenders. The male offenders. <laughs> Jackson found the challenge irresistible. He accepted the president's offer. Discussions soon began with England, the Soviet Union, and France on establishing a framework and a legal mechanism for the trial. Of particular importance was the decision-making process on whether to permit the defense of superior orders, that is, to allow the tribunal to consider in adjudging the guilt or innocence of a defendant who had committed a crime, his claim that he was just following orders in doing so. In the end, Jackson's view largely prevailed, and the charter of the tribunal, of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, was drafted to provide that this would not be countenanced as a defense per se, but only as a factor to be considered in sentencing individuals following their conviction. Although Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, and some of the other top Nazi criminals had committed suicide as the Third Reich collapsed and were thus beyond the reach of earthly justice, Hermann Goering and a large number of other Nazi regime figures were captured. Here's Goering shortly after his capture by US forces. The most senior captured Nazis were sent as we heard yesterday, to mondorf le -Bain, a resort town in Luxembourg, where the Palace Hotel had been converted into Allied Central Continental Prisoner of War Enclosure Number 32. Here's the Palace Hotel just before the war. 
appropriately codenamed Ashcan. It was, in this POW compound, stripped of its formerly uh, luxurious amenities that Goering, Rosenberg, Frank, Yodel, Stryker, Speer, and the others were confined and interrogated prior to their eventual trial at Nuremberg. Here you can see what the stripped-down dining room of the Palace Hotel looked like. As uh, Spartan as Goering's new surroundings were, they were at least more comfortable than those that he would have found at his vacation home in Berchtesgaden, the one that had been featured in Life magazine a decade earlier. It seemed uh, <clears throat> that some uh, Army Air Force bombs had managed to land right on it, uh, as you can see here in these uh, before and after photos. Um, here we see uh, Goering and the other Nazis at Mondorf, at Ashcan, in the only group photograph ever taken of them there. Wednesday, July 25, 1945, was an important day for Goering and also for Robert Jackson. July 25 found Jackson in London, leading the U.S. delegation at a conference of Allied authorities continuing the work on devising uh, plans to try the principal surviving Nazi perpetrators. On this date, July 25, 1945, the delegations were struggling to define the crime of waging aggressive war, something that greatly concerned the Soviets since they were guilty of that uh, very crime. Uh, the subsequent incorporation into the tribunal's charter of the crime of waging aggressive war was arguably Jackson's greatest contribution to international criminal law. And Hermann Goering's subsequent and richly deserved conviction of his crime would help to ensure that he would be sentenced to death. Confined at the Ashcan prisoner enclosure in Luxembourg, Goering could not have known it, but his fate was being sealed that day in those London deliberations by Robert Jackson and the others. On that very same Wednesday, July 25, while Robert Jackson was helping to shape what would become the first Nuremberg trial, and thus the first ever international criminal trial, Hermann Goering was languishing in Ashcan. The facility was run by a no-nonsense U.S. Army Colonel, Burton C. Anders, uh, who, among other things, dismissed the manservant uh, whom the still self-important Goering had brought with him. Limited to prisoners' rations instead of his customary huge servings of specially prepared foods, Goering began to shed the enormous girth that had long made him a subject of derision even in the Luftwaffe. That morning, unbeknownst to Goering, he was the subject of a story in the New York Times. It reported that he had been terrified by the arrival at Ashcan in recent days of a team of Soviet interrogators. If there was one thing that he and the other Nazis feared, it was being transferred from U.S. custody to Soviet custody. After all, Germany had murdered many millions of Soviet civilians and prisoners of war, and the Nazis at Mondorf knew that Stalin's men were unlikely to replicate the humane treatment that they were receiving from their American captors. So New Yorkers awoke on July 25 to this story, headlined, Goering Frightened by Russians Visit. As the Times reported it, the visit of Soviet interrogators, quote, scared the daylights out of Hermann Goering. On that same morning of July 25, a U.S. Army guard received a call on the internal phone system at the Mondorf POW facility. The Army major at the other end of the line instructed the guard that Herman Goering was to be brought up for interrogation. Send up fat stuff to Major Heckler, he heard the guard call, call out. To the major's amusement, he then heard that same instruction being repeated several times from one guard to the next down the corridor. Send up fat stuff to Major Heckler. None of the guards ever referred to Goering by his name there. He was always fat stuff. <laughs> Major Heckler, of course, was Major Kenneth W. Heckler of the U.S. Army's, uh, U.S. Army Europe's Historical Division. Here he is a little bit later as a colonel. Yes, sir, uh, our Ken Heckler, who would later become an aide to President Truman and then a distinguished nine-term member of Congress from West Virginia. Uh, the very same Ken Heckler who's just declared his candidacy for the Senate and who spoke here yesterday. One can imagine how relieved Herman Goering was to find that he would be questioned not by a Soviet interrogator, but rather by an American one. Here, supposedly, is Herman Goering at Mondorf, as uh, he was featured in World War II History magazine a, a few years ago, where they reprinted one of uh, uh, Ken Heckler's interrogations of Herman Goering. Uh, under Dr. Heckler's methodical questioning, Goering made admissions regarding his involvement in the planning of invasions that would make it impossible for him to, not, to deny at Nuremberg that he bore criminal responsibility 
for the perpetration of the crime of aggressive war. In London, meanwhile, as, as mentioned previously, Jackson continued uh, to negotiate the conditions under which the surviving Nazi leaders would be tried. On August 8, 1945, the London Agreement and the Charter of the International Military Tribunal were signed by the four powers. The Nazi leaders would be tried at Nuremberg later that year. Robert Jackson's quest no. Okay. The, uh, Robert Jackson's quest uh, and Francis Biddle's too had succeeded. On October 18, the two dozen top Nazis designated for the international trial were indicted by the four powers. Here it is reported in the New York Times. Justice Jackson quickly turned his attentions to preparing the facilities at Nuremberg, gathering the evidence, and seeing to the myriad other tasks that had to be completed in just a few months' time. He built a staff of more than 600 people. Much of the evidence would come from incriminating Nazi documents captured by Allied forces. Here's Nuremberg document specialist Donald Spencer, surrounded by stacks of those documents. Three decades later, Don would perform a similar function in my office, and I was very privileged to work with him. An entire book could be written about Jackson's remarkable work at, at Nuremberg. In fact, one is being written, and soon will be published. It's by Professor John Barrett of St. John's University Law School. John, who is without doubt the preeminent authority on Jackson, has wowed audiences at Chautauqua previously, and his research for what is surely going to be both a page turner and a tour de force of scholarship has included many trips to nearby Jamestown in order to mine the incomparable riches of the archives of the Robert H. Jackson Center. Well, what of Francis Biddle? When Harry Truman had assumed presidency in April 45, the new president asked for the resignations of the members of FDR's cabinet. According to Biddle's successor as Attorney General, Tom Clark, Biddle was the first cabinet member whose departure was sought by Truman. This uh, presumably didn't surprise Biddle, who in what proved to be uh, a both unsuccessful and ill-fated move, had worked against Senator Truman's nomination for vice president at the Democratic National Convention in the summer of 1944. And here we see him in his very dignified attire as attorney general at that convention. Uh, Biddle also uh, felt that Truman viewed him as a uh, rotten and Harvard man Someone who, like Franklin Roosevelt, but very much unlike Harry Truman, was a product of privilege. Still, uh, Truman had a hard time breaking the news to Biddle, uh, and uh, according to uh, Clark, he stammered his way through the meeting with, with Biddle. Truman's acceptance of Biddle's resignation was made public on May 23, and it was to be effective at the end of June. On leaving office, Biddle went off on an extended vacation, unsure of what he would do next. The US, UK, Soviet Union, and France, meanwhile, were each to provide one judge to sit on the tribunal at Nuremberg. In September of 1945, as Jackson and his team were working long hours to prepare for the late November opening of the Great Nuremberg Trial, President Truman reached a decision on appointing an American to serve as a judge at Nuremberg. A former federal official was tracked down to North Hatley, Quebec, Canada, where he and his wife were vacationing. White House aide James Byrne phoned and asked him if he would be willing to accept an appointment by President Truman to serve as the American judge at Nuremberg. A surprised former Attorney General Francis Biddle replied that he would call Burns back that following morning. Having not yet made any, any plans for his career and relishing the prospect of returning to public service, Biddle decided to accept. He and Mrs. Biddle returned to Washington at once and he was promptly received by the President and formally accepted the offer. Mr. and Mrs. Biddle soon set sail for Europe, naturally aboard the Queen Elizabeth. As preparations for the great trial were underway, Alexandra Slalakis, remember him, was relieved that he and his wife and daughters had been able to escape with the retreating German forces in 1944, when the Nazis abandoned Lithuania in the face of advances by the Soviet army. Best of all, he'd made it into an area of Germany controlled by US not Soviet forces. He promptly presented himself as a refugee and was accepted into a US-run displaced persons camp. He soon volunteered the talents he honed while working for the Nazi occupiers in Lithuania 
to the United States occupation forces in Germany, helping U.S. Uh, authorities identify suspected communists and communist sympathizers among the Lithuanian displaced persons, he was pleased when he was offered a formal relationship with U.S. military intelligence. He readily accepted. Doing a good job for uh, his U.S. Army masters might help him obtain permission to immigrate to the United States one day and thereby escape the miserable conditions of war-torn Germany and the ever-present danger that the Soviets might find him and take him into custody. He worked assiduously to keep his wartime past a secret. On November 21, 1945, while Lelekis was ma masquerading as a refugee, elsewhere in Germany, in Nuremberg, the real trial of the century began, and in calling it that, I mean no disrespect either to O.J. Simpson or Greta Van Susteren. Van Susteren. Uh, the world's media crowded into uh, a packed courtroom 600 uh, at the Palace of Justice, uh, one of the few major buildings in war-ravaged Nuremberg that hadn't been completely destroyed by Allied bombing. Francis Biddle was there, of course, sitting on an ele elevated platform with the other judges. Robert Jackson was there, too, as chief counsel for the United States of America. There as well, of course, was Hermann Goering, once one of the most feared men on the entire planet, now shorn of his power and perquisites and sitting with his fellow defendants. Robert Jackson is justly revered in the United States and abroad as Nuremberg's essential figure and thus a founding father of international criminal law. British prosecution team member G.D. Roberts would later, would later write that, quote, Jackson remained the greatest man at Nuremberg. The one significant chink in Jackson's armor, as most students of Nuremberg know, was inflicted during his much-anticipated cross-examination of Hermann Goering. Here you see Goering on the witness stand. And here's a very rare photo of Jackson actually cross-examining Goering. Jackson on your right and Goering on the far left. For all of Goering's evil, he was also brilliant and enormously clever. Try though Jackson did, his Perry Mason moment with Goering never arrived. In the courtroom duel between the two men, Goering famously got the upper hand. However, uh, a few points uh, need to be made. First. Jackson obtained important admissions from Goering. Interestingly, by the way, Goering did not invoke the superior orders defense. He basically said, I issued these orders and I was responsible for them. Second, though Goering was a World War I war hero and a person of undeniable courage, Jackson's grilling literally had him shaking. At one point, Goering was seen uh, placing one hand over his other wrist to stop it from shaking. Uh, and Goering later confessed to Nuremberg psychiatrist uh, Gustav Gilbert that he had been deeply embarrassed to be seen having to do this. Uh, finally, it needs to be said that Jackson's cross-examination was sabotaged by one of the Nuremberg judges. And that judge was none other than his former U.S. Justice Department subordinate, Francis Biddle. Unfortunately, the two men had gotten off to a bad start at Nuremberg even before the trial began. Biddle felt that Jackson was building an empire, hiring hundreds of people to do a job that could be done by far fewer people. They squabbled over a variety of picayune housekeeping type matters, such as Biddle's complaining that Jackson's executive assistant was trying to sow dissension among the judges by ordering modest armchairs for the alternate judges, but high-backed throne-like chairs for the four principal judges. Soon, Jackson and Biddle appeared to be engaging in a power struggle. Jackson, moreover, had maneuvered successfully to ensure that Britain's Sir uh, Geoffrey Lawrence, rather than his own countryman Francis Biddle, was selected as the chief judge at Nuremberg. Well, early in Jackson's cross-examination of Goering, he asked the defendant whether it wasn't true that people were interned in concentration camps without any recourse to the courts. I quote from author uh, Joseph Persico's account of what happened next. Goering began a lengthy answer, but Jackson interrupted, trying to limit him to yes or no. Goering shot back that he needed to explain. Jackson shut him off. Any such amplification, Jackson said, could be brought out on, re, uh, on redirect examination by Goering's own counsel. He started asking Goering another question when he saw Francis Biddle lean over and whisper to Judge Lawrence. Sir Jeffrey nodded, then stopped Jackson in mid-query 
Mr. Jackson, he said, the witness ought to be allowed to make what explanation he thinks right in answer to this question. Jackson flushed angrily. This ruling was contrary to cross-examination custom, Jackson knew, and he was convinced that Biddle was pulling Lawrence's strings. The prosecutor impatiently tapped, on his, his, tapped his pen on the stand as Goering was allowed virtually to lecture the court at will. Judge Biddle was also heard denigrating the performance of the U.S. prosecutors in a stage whisper. Jackson confided to his assistant, Elsie Douglas, that he felt that Biddle, who had previously worked for him, was trying to undermine him. And Jackson added that the fundamental difference between himself and Biddle was that Biddle was main line, while he, Jackson, was main street. Although Biddle, he opined, was lucky to have a job at all, he'd become haughty and full of himself. The hard feelings were shared by Biddle, who wrote to his wife that, I know he has it in for me, and I fear that we are no longer friends. Biddle believed that Jackson's grievance stemmed uh, from their suddenly reversed roles. Instead of working for Jackson at the Justice Department or, or being his supplicant at the uh, Supreme Court as Attorney General, it was now Biddle uh, who was the judge and Jackson the supplicant. The trial went on for many months, of course, uh, the last hearing being held in uh, August 1946. In the end, all but three of the defendants were convicted, and 12 of those convicted were sentenced to death. The landmark trial demonstrated to the world the possibility of the rule of law to prevail even over the most senior government officials, including men who had plunged the world into war and had perpetrated the crime of crimes, genocide. On October 16, 1946, 10 of the convicted men were hanged. Hermann Goering, of course, was not among them. Uh, he famously cheated the hangman, committing suicide in his jail cell with a hidden vial of cyanide the day before execution day. Here's how the New York Times reported it. Goering ends life by poison. Ten others hanged in Nuremberg prison for Nazi war crimes. Doomed men on gallows pray for Germany. Uh, when I first saw this, I noticed something else, and I think uh, my fellow uh, residents of the New York City area were actually focused on another front page story. Let's, let's zoom in on it. Oh, yeah. Cardinals take series as Brasheen beats the Red Sox for the third time, four to three. That was the beginning of the uh, curse of the Bambino. The bodies of, of Goering and, and the ten hanged defendants uh, were, uh, uh, or the nine hanged defendants, uh, were cremated and then taken by car uh, into the countryside where they were unceremoniously poured into a muddy gutter. After the trial, Robert Jackson returned to the United States Supreme Court and resumed his distinguished career on the court, playing a leading role in many of its uh, historic decisions. Justice Jackson died uh, prematurely on October 9, 1945 in Washington, D.C. at the age of 62 and was buried uh, not far from here near his boyhood home in Frewsburg. After Nuremberg, Francis Biddle joined the prominent Philadelphia law firm of uh, Deckard, Price and Rhodes. He published two volumes of memoirs in 1961 and 62. In the second one, he recalled Jackson's work at Nuremberg. He criticized audaciously Jackson's cross-examination of Goering in which he said, Jackson made important mistakes, and he contrasted Jackson's performance with the follow-up cross-examination of Goering conducted by the British prosecutor David Maxwell Fife, on, on, on whom he lavished extravagant praise. Francis Biddle died in 1968 at the age of 82. As Goering, Goering's ashes were being discarded, as Robert Jackson was returning to Washington, and as Francis Biddle was going home to Philadelphia, Alexander Slalakis was plotting his escape from Germany. In 1950, he applied to immigrate to the U.S. as a displaced person. This uh, was to prove difficult at first, as U.S. intelligence had in the meantime learned something of his wartime past. His initial application was rejected in this document by the United States Displaced Persons Commission on the basis that Lalakis had been, quote, a member of or participated in a movement that was hostile to the United States or its form of government, close quote, specifically by serving in the security police in Nazi-occupied Lithuania, quote, under the control of the Gestapo, close quote. In this formerly classified uh, 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 document, uh, actually uh, uh, affirming the immigration rejection, uh, it's noted that men who were in authority in these organizations were generally there because of their known Nazi sympathy, 
The chairman of the Displaced Persons Commission that rejected Lelakis was Mr. Yuko Karusi, whom we saw before in a photo depicting his prior service during the war as the executive assistant to then Attorney General Francis Bill. But Lelakis didn't give up, and his persistence paid off. He applied again for a visa a few years later, and he finally got those visas. By the time of his reapplication, I should tell you, U.S. military intelligence had a strong suspicion, uh, which, as we will soon see, was right on target, that Lelakis had been involved in the genocide of the Jews. Here we see a formally classified U.S. military intelligence report noting that Lelakis is possibly, quote, connected with the shooting of thousands of Jews in Vilna. Vilna, of course, being the, the Jewish name for Vilnius. Well, despite this suspicion or belief, Lelakis was approved for immigration. Presumably, his post-war service to U.S. intelligence was uh, anything but unhelpful in this process. What Lelakis did not know was that his employer actually was not U.S. military intelligence. In truth, he had been working for the CIA. That information was classified, by the way, and it was not until this decade that I could mention it publicly. Lelakis and his family entered the United States at the Port of New York City on November 22, 1955. After processing at Ellis Island, they raced up to Worcester, Massachusetts to join some family there. The following morning, November 23, 1955, a Wednesday, was the day before Thanksgiving. A reporter and photographer from the Worcester Evening Gazette showed up at the relative's home to do a story about these new immigrants. That afternoon, the paper went to press. Remember, we used to have afternoon newspapers? It went to press on Thanksgiving Eve with the Lelakis story on its cover page. Here's the front page photo from that article. We see Lelakis and his wife and others standing in the kitchen before a pot in which a no doubt fragrant Thanksgiving turkey is being cooked. The article portrayed the Lelakis family as the modern day equivalents of the Pilgrims, a story that, of course, has particular residents uh, up in Massachusetts. Like the Pilgrims, the article stated, the Lelakis family had fled persecution in Europe to make new lives in freedom here in the New World. Whereas the Pilgrims had escaped religious persecution in England, the Lelakis family had escaped persecution by the Soviet communist government that occupied, once again, Lithuania. Lelakis, the article said, would convey his thanks on Thanksgiving, his thanks to God in Lithuanian, since, quote, he speaks little English. The article continued, quote, it's obvious from his smile, and you can see it there, it's obvious that he will have plenty of thanks to offer. Indeed. For more than 25 years, the Lakers lived quietly in Massachusetts, working for a Lithuanian-American encyclopedia company. He applied for naturalization, and here's his 1976 U.S. naturalization photo. He became a United States citizen. Not until the early 1980s would the quietude of his new life begin to unravel. The Justice Department had uh, created my former office, the Office of Special Investigations, now the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, that was created in 1979 in the wake of several years of media disclosures about fugitive Nazi war criminals living in the United States. OSI was tasked by the Attorney General, Ben Civiletti, with the responsibility for identifying, investigating, and where sufficient evidence could be found civilly prosecuting Nazi war criminals to get their citizenships revoked, and get them deported from the United States, preferably to countries of Europe that had the criminal jurisdiction that we in the United States lacked. I was a, a young prosecutor at OSI in the early 1980s when uh, one of OSI's staff historians poring over prosecution and investigative records in West Germany cabled me that he had found a reference to an Alexandros Lelakis who was thought to be linked to the mass murder of the Jews in Vilnius, Lithuania. Waited with the Soviets to look in their archives again, find something that he signed, they found nothing. So there was nothing left to do but to try to interview Lelakis and see if he would make incriminating admissions. The early morning of June 27, 1983, found an OSI investigator and yours truly staking out Lelakis' home on a quiet street in Norwood, Mass. At a respectable hour, we knocked on the door. Lelakis agreed to speak with us. I asked the question. Lelakis readily acknowledged that he had been chief of the Lithuanian security police in Vilnius province during the war, during the Nazi occupation. But he insisted that his duties had encompassed only routine police and counterintelligence activities. He'd been focused on suspected communists, he said. When I asked about the Jews, 
Lelekis insisted he'd had nothing to do with them. The Germans had handled everything regarding the Jews. Finally, I, I reached for the only arrow, such as it was in my quiver, that doc, this document bearing his, his tight name and consigning 52 Jews to the custody of the killing squad at Ponari. I handed a photocopy of it to him. Calmly, he reviewed it. And just as calmly, he told me that he'd never seen this document before and had not issued it. He suggested that perhaps his men sometimes issued orders over his name without telling him. And then in words that would echo in my ears for years to come, he said, show me something that I signed. Well, he had me. We possessed no such incriminating documents. My investigator and I bade him farewell and returned to Washington. It took the collapse of the Soviet Union seven years later in 1990 and the dissolution of communist rule in Eastern and Central Europe to enable my office at last to make a case against the Lakers. In the autumn of 1990, OSI historian Mike McQueen was able to gain access to the archives in Lithuania, and there uh, he found that most of the documents of the security police had been indeed destroyed by Lelekis' men when they abandoned Vilnius. Prospects were bleak. But Mike decided to inquire whether there were any documents still in the Lukishki prison. It was still a prison. And sure enough, there he found prisoner files of some of Lelekis' victims. And, uh, Many of these documents uh, reflect, like this one, signed by Lelegas, reflect him sending named Jews to Ponari to be killed. Uh, but where might we find a confirmed sample of Lelegas' signature from around 1941 uh, that we could use to prove that these signatures were really his? The answer was in Berlin. Remember when I mentioned that uh, during his escape to Berlin in 1940, Lelegas had applied for German citizenship? And I showed one of those documents. Well, that whole file of citizenship, citizenship applications was captured by the United States Army when we captured Berlin in 1945. And that's where we found the confirmed sample. And when our handwriting expert compared them, the match was made. Uh, Michael Queen found other documents that uh, I'll quickly note. Uh, when Jews were apprehended uh, outside the ghetto, uh, their identity documents were seized and placed in the file. McQueen found some of those documents, so now we could associate faces with the names of some of Lelekis' victims. Here then are three of Alexandros Lelekis' Jewish victims. This is Alta Knop. Notice she, at the bottom you could see she was signing her name in Hebrew. I always imagine that this photo must have been taken during the Nazi occupation uh, based on the, the look on her face. Here's uh, Irsha Levinas. That's the Lithuania, Lithuanianized version of what we would know as Hirsch Levine. He's wearing the pre-war Lithuanian army uniform. He did his duty for his country. It didn't save his life. And finally, here's a young, young lady, Esther Sandlery, also sent by the Lakers to die. Uh, the documentation that Mike found that was perhaps most poignant, and it was mentioned in the NBC piece, related to a Jewish woman named Gita Kaplan, uh, age 35, and her daughter, Fruma. And we see uh, their fate in three documents. Here's a German document that shows them being held at the Lukishki prison. Number five is Kaplan, Kamagita. Number six is Kaplan, parenthesis, kin, child, Sexyara, six years old, Fruma. And that's how we knew how old she was, from this on only from this document. And they were both held in cell number 17 at the Lukishki prison. Here's Lelekis' signed order sending the Jewess Gita Kaplan and her minor daughter, it says, uh, Fruma, uh, to the custody of the German police chief, who was the German officer in charge of the special detachment at Ponari. And then finally, the deaths of mother and daughter were confirmed on these two cards. Kaplan, Gita, Jewess, she was Befelsgemess behandelt, handled according to orders on the 22nd of December, 1941. In dead of winter, she and her little girl were sent to that killing pit to the edge where the bodies of thousands of Jews who'd been murdered before them lay. Gita Kaplan facing the ultimate parental nightmare knowing that not only she but her daughter was going to die and there was absolutely nothing she could do to protect her. On September 21, 1994, by which time I was serving as OSI's director, bring this to an end, we, we filed suit in U.S. District Court to revoke Lelekis' U.S. citizenship. Here's a picture from the front page of the Boston Globe taken from a TV news film uh, showing what Lelekis looked like when he came to the door. He, of course, refused to speak to the media. 
Uh, we provided defense counsel with copies of all the documents we found, and in a, in a brief submitted to U.S. District Court Judge Richard Stearns, Lolakis' lawyers referenced these documents in a very strange way. Their client, they said, was merely, quote, a disembodied issuer of orders. And I, I was flabbergasted. This was the very opposite of the superior orders defense that was commonly asserted by the defendants at Nuremberg and at subsequent uh, Nazi trials. They had, after all, merely followed orders, but the Lakers was issuing them. Uh, I instructed our, our prosecutors to point that out to the judge and to note that at Nuremberg, even uh, following criminal orders was an impermissible defense. On May 24, 1996, Judge Stearns issued a decision uh, revoking the Lakers' United States citizenship. The judge made express reference to the tragic cases of Gita and Fruma Kaplan. He was as shocked as we are, as we were at seeing uh, an execution order, a death warrant for a six-year-old girl. Uh, since they have no grave and no photos of them have survived, I sometimes think that the only memorial to Gita and Fruma Kaplan is the judge's decision published uh, in this book, one of the principal volumes of federal court decisions. There's the actual first page of the decision. The judge, by the way, also cited in his decision Nuremberg trial, uh, uh, trial exhibit L180, a captured Nazi report that documented the killing of more than 200,000 Jews and references the reconstitution uh, by the German occupation authorities of Lithuanian security police. In his written decision, Judge Stearns also took note of the Lakers' novel argument about the orders that he'd signed. And here's what he wrote. As the government nicely put it at oral argument, Lelakis is attempting to stand the Nuremberg defense on its head by arguing that I was only issuing orders. Uh, as the uh, pages of the judge's decision sputtered out of our fax machine in Washington, a few of us stood there sharing each one. When I reached the parts of the judge's decision uh, that twice referenced Nuremberg, my thoughts immediately turned to the man who more than any other was responsible for rendering the superior orders defense, and hence the issuing orders defense, unavailable to perpetrators of crimes against humanity. Remarkably, 42 years after his death, Robert Jackson had helped bring yet another Nazi criminal to justice. Soon thereafter, by the way, Willegas went on criminal trial in Lithuania, in the first genocide trial ever held in any of the successor states to the former Soviet Union. Last slide. On the walls of my office's conference room, Greg and Adam and some of you have been there, uh, at the United States Department of Justice in Washington, above all of the other items displayed there, is a pair of photographs of the 57th Attorney General of the United States of America. One shows that man, Robert Jackson, as Chief of Counsel for the United States at Nuremberg. The other shows him as Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And every time we walk into our conference room, we are inspired by his shining example. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions if people have to leave, I understand. Please. Uh, the outcome of the trial of Alexandra Salekis. Well, first of all, the Lithuanians didn't want to try him, and uh, a lot of pressure was brought to bear uh, on, on the Lithuanian authorities to do the right thing. It's the only time in the history of my office that the White House actually uh, intervened. Vice President Al Gore met with the president of Lithuania and said, we expect you to discharge your moral obligations in these cases. Uh, Lilekis uh, was brought to trial in Vilnius, and on the opening day of trial, he stood up and made a defiant statement to the court, insisting on his innocence. He then sat down, reached for his chest, said, I'm really not feeling well. Coincidentally, there was an ambulance already waiting outside, hmm. and uh, uh, took him away. And the judge thereafter ruled him medically incapable of proceeding. Uh, we at the Justice Department offered to pay for an independent medical appraisal with uh, three physicians, one from Lithuania, one from the United States, and one from Israel, uh, and the court turned us down. The Lakers uh, 
uh, who was supposedly too ill to stand trial, spent the next year writing his autobiography, which was published with uh, a photograph of Alexander Stolakis posed like this, defiantly, uh, on the frontispiece. And he died not long thereafter. Uh, a not uncommon result in our cases. Uh, Europe, uh, European, European governments have, uh, with very few exceptions, failed to discharge their legal and moral obligations in the Nazi cases. Why do you think that is? Why, well, why would they not step up to the plate? Ooh, uh, that's, that requires me to be a psychologist. Uh, I, well, for one thing, if, if Germany and Austria say, and Austria is where Hitler and Eichmann and many others came from, had actually prosecuted all of the people in those countries who had played a role in Nazi crimes against humanity, uh, they would have had to prosecute tens and hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, that, was nothing, that was not something they were prepared to do. Each of these prosecutions is an embarrassment, after all, because it reminds the world uh, of the terrible crimes that were committed under German government auspices during World War II. Most of our defendants in this country perpetrated their crimes at the behest of the German government, wore German government issued uniforms to carry them out, were issued ammunition by the German government, and were paid by the German government of that time to carry out those crimes. And I think uh, many in Europe just don't want to be reminded of the crimes, the criminals, the collaborators, put it behind them. Was it ever discovered how Goring got the pills to commit suicide? There was always a story that an army jailer smuggled in some pills to him and became friends with him. The, the question was, was it ever discovered how Goring was able to commit suicide, how he got the cyanide? Uh, there was uh, an immediate investigation and uh, suspicion fell on one of the guards and there have been different accounts over the years, various people have said they figured it out. Um, I think it probably was one of the guards, uh, and there was certainly one uh, who had befriended Goering, uh, but I, I, we may never know. We may never know. Do you have a proven order as the latest um, that turned the Jews over to a German uh, slot? Is there a legal challenge that you have to deal with as far as um, linking that order to Right. Well, uh, the question was if, it's, if we have these orders turning, uh, signed by the Lakers, turning Jews over to the killing squad, is there a legal challenge that could be mounted uh, 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 requiring us to prove that the order was actually carried out, basically, right? That, that there was a link between the uh, Lakers' order and, and the killings. Uh, you know, the Lakers hardly challenged our evidence. Uh, but had, had we had to prove that, uh, well, actually, we did prove it. We had those execution cards. I only showed you two of them. But we were able to show that the people he sent to be killed uh, were killed, with one exception. Uh, just as we were about to go to the main hearing, my dear friend Mike McQueen runs into my office, <clears throat> and he says, without even telling me which of the many cases we're working on together, uh, he's, he's talking about it. He goes, guess who survived the war? I said, I don't know, Mike, who survived the war? He says, Abram Blazer. And I was about to say, holy something, uh, not pleasant. And then I caught myself and realized, well, that's very good news. But I said, Mike, what do you mean Abram Blazer survived the war? We have an order from the Lagos sending him to the killing squad at Panari. And you told me that that means that those people, you know, were sent to be killed. He said, wait, look at this. Turns out that in the 1960s, I believe, uh, German authorities gained access to a, a set of interviews that the Soviet authorities conducted when they retook Vilnius in 1944. The few Jews who were alive came out of hiding. One of them was Blazin. And they asked, they, they interviewed him, wrote it up in Russian, shared it with the Germans, um, Germans translated it into German so they could understand it, and we had the German text. Mike says, look at this. Blazer recounts his wartime story. He says, I was arrested on this and this date. 
and I was sent to Panarin. And I stood in front of the pit, the shots were fired, everybody fell into the pit, myself included, but I feigned being shot, and I fell in uh, with all of the dead bodies and dying people and gore, and, and I lay there as other people fell on top of me till nightfall. With the Germans gone, with the waning killers gone, I crawled out and someone hid me. He then gets captured again, and he's sent to Panari again. Unfortunately, this time, he is sent with a small group of Jews near the end of the war, uh, whose uh, terrible job it is to unearth all the 50,000 Jews and burn the bodies so that there'd be no evidence when the Allies came. Some of these men uncovered their own family members. They made what is perhaps the greatest escape of World War II. Using, they had to live in this, these pits. Using spoons, they dug a tunnel and they got out. And Abram Blazer survived the war, obviously, to speak to the Soviet. My greatest hope for this case was we would find Abram Blazer. This would have been our Perry Mason moment. This man, whom the Germans thought they killed, there's even an execution card for him because they thought they killed him walks into federal district court in Boston, Massachusetts, brought back almost literally from the dead to testify against the man who sent him to die. That would have been great, except we never could find Abram Blazer. Turned out, he was a sort of a petty criminal before the war, that probably helped him survive, and he had changed his name from Blazer to Kagan, which is a variant on Cohen, I'm told, and I think by the time we were looking for him, if he was still alive, he was probably on his 12th name, and we never did find him. But I hope that he lived a nice, long life and was able to build a family. Yeah. Uh, when the uh, German military officials were confined in Mondor and being interrogated prior to their trial, I think we learned yesterday that they were not aware Well, I can't be sure, you know, what they knew, but of course they didn't have access to newspapers. They they weren't told what was what was going on. Uh, so I think it's 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 true that they were not aware of, of what was to happen. Obviously, the senior leaders knew that nothing pleasant lay ahead of them. Um, the um, eventually they were uh, flown to to Nuremberg, and my favorite story of that was told by a great friend of the Jackson Center who has spoken for the Jackson Center before, John Dolaboy of, of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, who also was at Mondorf. And he had the uh, uh, unfortunate uh, responsibility to sit with um, uh, uh, Kaltenbrunner, the scariest looking of all of the defendants at Nuremberg. He looked kind of like Lurch from the old Adams Family TV show with this big dueling scar across the side of his face and they had to be handcuffed together. And Dalboy's told me that the entire flight, he worried that Kaltenbrunner was gonna jump up and jump out the airplane and take him with him. <laughs> yeah. Gee, I'm sure we have a lot of uh, Clevelanders in the room, and that's a, a very high-profile case in Cleveland. John Demianyuk was a Nazi death camp guard at the Sobibor death camp uh, in uh, Nazi-occupied Poland. He also served at the Majdanek concentration camp and later at the Flossenburg <coughs> concentration camp in Germany. Uh, it, it took us uh, 10 years in round two of the Demianyuk citizenship and deportation case to finally get him out. We got him out because some very wonderful uh, investigative magistrates in Ludwigsburg, Germany, uh, found it in their hearts to care about this case. And they uh, gained access from us to all the evidence and uh, agreed that Demianyuk was subject to German jurisdiction. And they agreed that if we would deport him, they would take him. 
Uh, it was very difficult in the end to deport John de Bianca uh, because he was feigning illness. And some of you will remember the video of the first attempt we made when our colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement had to take him out on a stretcher. Uh, he was looking like he had one, um, uh, one foot already in the grave. His mouth was open. He was like this. And every time the uh, U.S. government physician would touch him, I wish I had brought the video with me, every time uh, Greg seen it, every time he would touch him, he would call out, Oi! 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 Bay! When I heard Oi! Bay, I said, now wait a minute. That's a copyrighted expression. You can't use it, John. <laughs> um, uh, we were able to uh, get, he then got a, a court order staying his removal and we had to take him back home. Uh, we finally got the courts to see through this when we produced to them the surveillance video that we had taken the day before our attempt to remove him when he went to an appointment in some building and he was walking without any support, without even a cane. He was looking fine. And then also the video that we took when they removed him on the stretcher and he looked like, you know, death warmed over and uh, we had him at ICE headquarters in Cleveland. They took video of him smiling, laughing, joking with the staff, you know. It was only when he, he knew that people were looking at him that he pretended to be infirm again. So it, it, we finally got him to, to Germany where he faces uh, 28,000 uh, plus counts of accessory to murder. The trial, I'm told, is going well. A witness was found, <clears throat> uh, another SS uh, guard who served with him. Uh, at Flossenburg at the end of the war, and that's a very important uh, piece of evidence in the chain of evidence, and he's testified against the uh, Unfortunately, the trial is going very slowly because uh, every uh, few weeks the court decides that the uh, needs some medical treatment, so they have to postpone the hearings, but uh, stay tuned. Please, Dr. Heckler. Uh, I think uh, Eli deserves a special medal for being a tireless advocate of the rule of law. I think he deserves an ovation. Two minutes. Thank, thank you so much for that. It is really a great privilege to be entrusted with this responsibility. I say that on behalf of all of my colleagues. Uh, to represent the people of the United States in the pursuit of justice, to be able to meet so many survivors of these crimes, and we do also cases involving uh, modern day crimes against humanity. We just, just took a guilty plea two weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale from uh, Gilberto Bourdain, for instance, who uh, took part in a massacre in, in Guatemala in 1982. He personally threw a living baby into a well, following, following which the hand grenades went in. Um, Meeting the, the victims uh, inspires us, and uh, it, it really is an enormous honor uh, to pursue justice on their behalf. So thank you. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Eli Rosenbaum. I can't thank you enough. And thanks, everybody, for attending.